Welcome to the first part in our series, Look Up, a Reformation Study. Perhaps you're wondering why we would, we would study the Reformation so early. Isn't Reformation Day sometime in October? Well, this whole year gives us a wonderful opportunity to review what led to this Reformation. The Reformation was not just a one-time event. It didn't happen just when one man nailed 95 theses on the door and then the Reformation had occurred. No, it was a lifetime of work not just the lifetime of one man, but of many, many people. It would go on and on, and in fact, the Reformation is still going on today. To better understand what the Reformation was, we'll look at the biblical principles that were restored and refreshed in this Reformation. We'll see that there is a lot to celebrate. Many different church bodies and government organizations have decided to celebrate this year. 500 years is a great milestone to commemorate any event. In Germany, it's interesting that they will use the theme Am Anfang war das Fort, which is the first words in the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word. This motto does summarize what the Reformation was. In the beginning was the word talks about using sola scriptura, scripture alone. It points to who the word was, Jesus Christ, through Christ alone, and that we are saved through faith by God's grace alone. The Missouri Synod has a wonderful theme as well, Reformation, it's still all about Jesus. Our own Wisconsin Synod still has the theme, grace, faith, and scripture, the core biblical principles this study will look at. Perhaps you'll find other posters focusing on the different words and movements and culture that Luther himself brought about. There are many reasons to celebrate the Reformation, but why pick one man? You'll notice that Martin Luther's portrait, in fact the same portrait, is portrayed in many of these posters. It was not one man that caused the Re Re Reformation to happen, it was God and his will. He didn't use just one man for this to happen either. But by studying one man's life, we can see what happened before, during, and after the Reformation. We can see how God was at work, and not just one man's own will or imagination. Our theme is Look Up. As you enter the sanctuary at Resurrection Lutheran Church, you may see this wooden engraving, Sola Gratia, Sola Fide, Sola Scriptura the core principles of the Reformation, the core principles of the Christian faith. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and we know this only through the scriptures. If you'd like to sing a hymn to start this study, you could look up the hymn, The People That in Darkness Sat. This hymn reveals that if you don't have the light of Christ, you sit in darkness and you cannot see any light at all. But as the Reformation came about, Christ was brought back. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Now, what was happening right before the Reformation? As I mentioned earlier, it may be best to understand this by following one man's life. Now, we won't bog you down with a long list of dates and names and places. But some things are good to have in the back of your head as just some foundational information. Luther was born in Eisleben in modern-day Germany on November 10, 1483, just nine years before Christopher Columbus sailed the blue and, well, tried to discover a path to the Indies, but accidentally rediscovered North and South America. Martin Luther's father belonged to an emerging middle class Often when we think of the Middle Ages, we think of an entrenched feudal system where you have the king, and then his lords, then the knights, and then most of the population, a bunch of peasants, basically slaves, tied to the land. Well, Luther's family didn't really fit carefully or nicely into that tiered structure. They weren't nobles, they weren't lords, but they weren't really slaves tied to the land either. They were freemen. They could own their own land, and they can move about without Lord's permission. Luther's father decided that he wanted to make it big for himself. He wanted to work hard so his family could have 
more money and more opportunities that he couldn't have. Sounds a lot like the American dream, doesn't it? Luther's father worked in the mines, and he smelted ore, and eventually he became rather wealthy. Luther made sure, Luther's father made sure that he would go to good schools in Mansfeld and Magdeburg, eventually going to the law school in Erfurt. Erfurt was called the Rome of the North, and had so many churches and monasteries and abbeys, it felt as if you were in the holy city, Rome itself. But something shook up Luther's plan. Luther was supposed to become a lawyer, supposed to win fame and recognition for the Luther name, supposed to become a wealthy man like his father. Yet several near-death experiences made Luther to change his mind. Luther almost severed an artery in his leg and bled to death when he, his knife slipped out of its sheath. Later on, some of his friends died from the plague, and then Luther himself, on his way home, was almost struck by lightning and killed. Out of desperation, he made a deal with God, or so he thought, by praying to St. Anne. He promised that if God would spare him, he would become a monk. Luther's life would change radically ever since this point. Why would Luther make a deal with God? Why would he be so afraid? Well, often, many people at this time viewed Christ not as a savior, not as a loving Lord, but as a stern judge. You can see in this painting from the time how he, out of one side of his head comes the sword of judgment, out of one side a lily of peace. Below him stands the, or the angel Michael, who weighs people's souls based on their good works. Are you light enough? Are you good enough to go up to heaven? Or do your sins weigh you down and take you to hell? Christ, an angry judge, not a loving savior. That being the case, if you're weighed on your own sins, very few would be worthy of heaven. But that didn't mean that if you believed in God but still had a lot of sins, you'd go to hell. Believers would still go to heaven eventually, but they would have to burn off all of their sin in a made-up place called purgatory. Once they got rid of all that extra sin, they would be considered good enough to get into heaven. In fact, at this time, so many people were interested and concerned about dying and how to get to heaven, there appeared many manuals for dying. Here's a quote from one of these manuals. O Mary, let me never hear the voice of Jesus, the strict judge. O gentle, compassionate, and sweet Mary, stand by me now, because today I might fight a battle on which my poor soul's eternal bliss or eternal damnation depends. People didn't want to go to hell. People didn't really want to go to purgatory either. So there is a nice long list of things you can do to be pious, to be holy, to make sure that you would spend as little amount of time in purgatory as possible. Luther must have been plagued by his life and wondered if he was making God happy. He knew the answer to that problem. If he became a monk, he would live a, a life away from most temptations. He would live a life in constant service to God. If you wanted to make sure you didn't go into purgatory, being a monk or a nun was a good way to get that started. But what did it mean to be a monk? It depends on your order. You had Augustinians, Dominicans, and Benedictine monks, among many others. But usually you had to spend at least six hours in church a day, six different prayer times, and at least one mass a day. Now if it were a special holiday or holy day or a festival, you could expect one or two more masses to be held each day. Normally you only had one or two meals a day. Now during Lent and Advent, you definitely only got one meal. The monastery at Erfurt didn't have any heat. You were just expected to tough it out. There was punishment and penance for every perceived sin. And we're not talking about breaking people's skulls open with chairs in a bar fight type of sin. We're talking about, did you forget to confess other sins? Did you grumble about your chores? Did you laugh or giggle in the hallway? You really needed to be punished to make sure you wouldn't sin again, to make sure that you were very sorry for that sin. And of course, when you became a monk, you had to give up all of your possessions. In fact, it was designed so you wouldn't have enough food on your own to survive. If you wanted to continue to live, you had to beg. 
Now, doesn't that make you humble if you have to beg? And of course, you had to be celibate. Naturally, that would include not talking to the member of the opposite sex ever at all. You really wanted to be pious. Don't even talk to them. Here are some quotes from Martin Luther showing how serious he was about this. He wasn't just going through the motions. He wasn't becoming a monk because he wanted the good life, a free life, a worry-free life. No, he wanted to earn his way into heaven. I almost fasted myself to death, for again and again I went for three days without taking a drop of water or a morsel of food. I was very serious about it. I took the vow not for the sake of my belly, but for the sake of my salvation, and I observed all our statutes very strictly. This quote reveals his motivation. God has established the covenant that whoever turns to him and does what he can will receive forgiveness of sins. God infuses grace into such a man. This was by Gabriel Beale, a famed theologian at the time. The picture on the right, sketched in 1520, shows how Luther would look like as a monk. Rather thin, sunken cheeks, he was definitely not putting on any weight. We'll wait and see what happens later. Another step in being pious was part of the general culture, uh, available to monks and laymen alike. You pray to the saints. If Christ was the strict judge, you probably didn't want to bother him in prayer. But his mother, more compassionate and with some womanly gentleness, would probably be able to get his ear for you and interpret your prayers in the way you wanted them to. We would remember that Luther also prayed to Saint Anne, he, she was the patron saint of minors, and being from a minor family, that's who Luther prayed to. But you really had a lot of options. You didn't have to stick with one or two saints, as Luther said here. I chose 21 saints and prayed to three each day. I prayed especially to the Blessed Virgin, who with her womanly heart would compassionately appease her son. There were many other ways to be pious, to be holy. Often it meant traveling to a holy site where you could see the tomb of a saint, relics or basically artifacts associated with a saint, miraculous sites where saints and apostles perform miracles. The major sites, the, the big bucket list sites, would be Rome, Santiago de Compostela, and the Holy Land. On the right we see a painting commissioned by Frederick the Wise himself to commemorate his pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the most holy of holy sites. It was a big, once-in-a-lifetime accomplishment to make it to the Holy Land. Luther didn't quite make it there, but on a trip and on duty for his monastery, he did go to Rome. Yet, he didn't really feel much more forgiven by the time he left. One of the attractions of going on a pilgrimage was that you got to see relics artifacts, leftovers from holy people. Frederick the Wise was renowned for his large collection of relics held locally at Wittenberg itself. He actually had an, a catalog describing all of the relics and what they were, how many he had, and what they would do for you. Here's an excerpt. Five particles of milk of the Virgin Mary, four pieces of hair of Mary, 13 pieces of the manger, 2 pieces of hay, 1 piece from the burning bush of Moses. Now there was great benefit if a pious person viewed a relic. Each relic would chop off a hundred days of indulgence. Now with an impressive collection of over 5,000 pieces, he would have over 500,000 days off from purgatory. I don't know about you, but I don't even know how long I'm supposed to be in purgatory. 500,000 days, and that wasn't even supposed to be enough? The truth is, since purgatory was fabricated over time through tradition, no one really knew exactly how many days of purgatory they were supposed to get per sin. But it could total easily into the millions. And that's why viewing relics was an important part of a believer's life. To understand the Reformation, it's also beneficial to understand just how the world worked at this time. Now we're not going to go into great detail with dates or places, at least not too much, but understanding that Germany today is very different from Germany back then, and nothing like the United States, will help us understand 
how the Reformation happened the way it did. Luther did not belong to a country called Germany, but he grew up in the electorate of Saxony and some of the cities on the outside of that territory. But the larger political body was the Holy Roman Empire. Voltaire would famously quote decades and centuries later that the empire was neither holy nor Roman nor really an empire. Think of it this way. Imagine the United States, 50 separate states, with one president who could sometimes get every state to cooperate with him if he bribed and begged enough. There's nothing really holy about the empire because while well, some state was some land was church land, some areas were purely secular, and people didn't really care about being holy all that much. It was not really Roman because for many centuries Rome wasn't even part of this empire. And it's not really an empire if every state does what it wants. Now the Concordat of Worms really had a big design change in this empire. Earlier, the emperor got to choose every single bishop within his country, but that brought him into a clash with the pope. The pope said bishops are church people. They shouldn't be put in place by a secular ruler. But then the emperor would counter, well, these religious bishops are ruling over secular territories. They own land. They receive taxes from the land. I should be able to appoint them. Well, in the tiff and the fights that happened between the Pope and the Emperor over history, eventually the Emperor kind of lost. The Pope had ultimate control over the Church in every country. Now the Golden Bull of 1356 kind of established some ground rules for who became Emperor. It was slightly unclear until this time, but the Golden Bull Said, said that there were seven electors in the entire Holy Roman Empire. Now remember, during election time we say, your vote counts. Every single person, person should vote because their vote counts. But in this system, it was really only your count that votes. And really not every count got to vote either. They only had seven people who could vote in the Holy Roman Empire for the emperor. There were seven electors. This map on the left shows how complicated the Holy Roman Empire was. Its territory extended into 11 different modern-day countries, Germany, of course, being at its core. Some of these territories were owned by secular families. Many other territories, the ones in the darkish, bluish purple, were all held by princes of the church, bishops and archbishops. This image shows the many different types of families and heraldry represented in the empire, many different states, each acting more or less independently from each other, often as rivals to each other. But there were only seven electors, the Archbishop of Mainz, the Archbishop of Trier, the Archbishop of Cologne, the King of Bohemia, the Duke of Saxony, Margrave of Brandenburg, and Count Palatine of the Rhine. On the left, you'll notice that three of these seven electors are church people, people who belonged mostly to the Pope. They would usually vote in a voting block. The King of Bohemia also often was a Habsburg, a member of the family that ruled most of Austria, and now by this time had possessions in the Netherlands and in Spain and in Italy. The Duke of Saxony just happened to be Luther's overlord, Frederick the Wise. This would be very important later on. The other two were also secular rulers. Now we talked about the relationship between the empire and the papacy. People had this question, was the Pope really God's representative? To ask such a question was dangerous, but people began to ask after the papal schism. There was one Pope that, well, France didn't like so much. They got their own pope. So for a while there were two popes. And then the church council decided, we don't like these two popes. Let's fix the problem by electing a third. It got out of hand. More and more popes were elected until they were all cut. And they finally got one pope back on top. But it kind of showed that you can't really have more than one pope. Something wasn't quite right. Right. 
At the Council of Constance, the Church Council tried to straighten out this problem of multiple popes and how to make sure you only had one pope in the future. This was all part of the conciliarism movement, where many people in the Church believed that Church Councils should be held above popes to keep such problems from happening again. At the Council of Constance, another issue was brought up, the issue of Jan Hus. Jan Hus saw that the papal schism really reflected how poorly the papacy was working in the Christian world, and argued against having a pope in the first place. He also argued for many reforms, such as the reformation of indulgences and the reformation of the practice of Holy Communion. But going against the church hierarchy led to his swift death and execution at the Council of Constance, a hundred years before Luther ever started his reformation. This is what we see in Renaissance life at the time of the beginning of the Reformation. You often saw an increase in ritual, more and more processions, increase in religious foundations, so more monasteries and more abbeys, but also increased secularization. Non-church rulers and secular powers were having more and more influence and contact with church matters. One could say that the piety itself didn't need to change. The people's desire to do what pleased God was there, but its focus was all backward. It wasn't focused on Jesus, it wasn't focused on God, but focused on their own, somewhat superstitious, acts. This image shows what a church procession or a church festival would often look like. You may see in the background there are many people lined up to go to church, but they're distracted by the music that's being played. Some people on the left have already left the church procession and are looking at the wares set up at the fair for the church. In the foreground we see what's really going on. Pickpockets, drinking, selling of goods, and perhaps a charlatan doctor trying to get some money from an unwitting customer. Yes, there were church festivals, but it was more like your county or state fair. At this time, we're t doing a change in gear. It would be good if we also studied biblical principles that underlie and show what was going on at this time in Europe before the Reformation. On your own, you may want to pause the video, you can look up Judges 2, 7, and 10 through 13. You could ask the question, what was the cause of Israel's turn to idolatry? Moving on, you can go to 2 Kings 22, 10 through 20. We see that the word was forgotten and lost. What did the people of Judah really deserve? And what was God's response to humility? And how did God bring about this change? Going on to Nehemiah, you can go to Nehemiah 8, 1, 5 through 6, then 8 through 12. Why would the people weep? when they heard the word? What was the people's response to their newfound understanding of the word? Now we have some passages giving us a warning and encouragement. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 and Matthew 23, 8 through 12 give us what warnings does Jesus tell us? You can then turn to Hebrews 13 verse 7. What encouragement does this passage offer? Agree or disagree, studying Christian history after the Bible should be done for purely sentimental reasons. This concludes our Look Up! A Need for Reformation study. We'd like to close with this prayer. For next week, part two, we'll see that Sola Gratia, one of the foundations of the Reformation, was beginning to be rediscovered by Luther as he read more and more of God's Word. Let's close with prayer. We offer our prayers of gratitude that you control all history for the benefit of your church. We pray that the word remain in our midst despite attacks from within and without. We pray that we always see Christ clearly, rely on Christ completely, and praise Christ eternally. We offer our prayers that our pastors continue to serve as gentle shepherds, nourishing souls through scripture. Amen.